Through a Scottish Prism, the programme that is unapologetically pro-Scottish independence and anti-Westminster rule. Everything we say here is viewed through a Scottish Prism. Brought to you by Barhead Boy. Hi right, folks, welcome back to Through a Scottish Prism. I hope you and yours are well. Been another hell of a week, uh, lots to talk about. Um, firstly, just to say Lloyd again, can't you, and she's... Uh, Still having uh, some issues that he's at home. He's got to get sorted. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll have him back very, very soon. And uh, wish him and his family well. Um, this is the first listen, folks, because uh, I'm recording this in Barhead, which is the first. I've not done it. Would you believe it? The Barhead boy has never recorded in Barhead. And here I am today. And I'm joined over there in Brussels, a man who was heading to Coat Bridge, the Coat Brig, who didn't make it. Good old Ryanair cancelled the slate this morning. It's our Coatbridge Cavalier himself, Mr. Boswell. How do you, Roddy? All right. Not better than you. Your old plane cancelled it. Ah, I was a bit scunnered with that one because I was looking forward to a few scoops tonight and uh, joining the troops and meeting everybody for the rally tomorrow. And uh, to commemorate what was a magnificent experience um, and what captured the heart and soul of the Scots. And those who live and work here that are passionate about freedom and self-determination. It was a wonderful experience, that which we experienced 10 years ago. And uh, it would, it's been nice to commemorate it tomorrow. hope it's a nice day. I um, hope it doesn't chuck it down. But uh, let's see. Uh, who knows? You never know. That's the thing about events in Scotland over the winter. Because winter is coming. Or it might even be there yet. Because I heard it was minus one in Coatbridge last night or something. But here well, it's, it's cooling down here too. What's that? If you don't like, if you don't like the weather in Scotland, hang about for twenty minutes. Aye, <laughs> that's true. But here we are. Hopefully, well, I think there is some shower forecast, but we shouldn't. Well, because we're recording this tonight before, folks, because we've got um, we've got uh, tomorrow, we've got uh, the, the the hope over fear, and then we're going to go out for a few share. But so we thought maybe not record on Sunday morning this time. So we've done it now Friday night, and uh, hopefully we don't miss anything. But also. Here we've got our favourite lawyer up there in Clackman, and our Eve is joining us, of course. Eva, how are you? Hi, Roddy. I always feel a slight trepidation at this time of year when people know that I live in Clackmannanshire, given its notoriety in 2014. Um, so I look forward to the day when Clackmannanshire delivers a resounding vote in favour of independence, which I think that Man and Shire will do the next time there is an electoral event. And I sincerely hope that that is an election to the Scottish Parliament sometime before 2026. But I'm looking forward to our discussions tonight because there's been some monumental news for Scotland and in Scotland this week. Some of it very good and some of it potentially extremely bad. But I hope that the bad news delivers the adrenaline and, quite frankly, the kick up the arse that a lot of Scots require to get themselves out on the street and get active and get politically motivated, get this independent show on the road and take our country towards freedom by the earliest, quickest route, because by God, that's what's needed. Indeed, and we'll talk about that certainly later on the show. But, you know, the thing is, when we have the Tories in, oh, go get the Tories out, go get the Tories out. The one thing I'll say to the Tories, they tell you, they're going to screw us over before they come in, and they, they, they screw us over without a doubt. But the other mob, the other Tories, that call themselves the Labour Party, they always promise us my whole life, the land of milk and honey, just give us one more chance, we've learned a lesson, just this time, we can do it, we can take care of it. And what do they do? They lie, they cheat, they let us down, and leave us in a worse state than before. Just let me not, never forget this. My lips. No austerity under Labour. Watch my lips fill with no austerity under Labour. Just one of the many Labour lies we're going to cover tonight. Um, you never change. Leopards never change their spots, and the Labour leopard never change its spots. No, not since they've abandoned the days of the ragged trousers philanthropist and true socialism and looking out for the people of Scotland. So, no, this sounds like uh, something that would be said under Nicola's SNP, because Labour are the Red Tories, as we keep saying. A disgrace to the once great and proud Labour Party that led us, the people, out of servitude. But now they are very much part of the machine that is forcing us back there. So that's that's the tragedy here. Um, there was a, a great article in The Canarian in, earlier in 2024 
report by James Wright, I think it was, where they highlighted the, that Labour announced announces a George Osborne tribute act with bogus with a bogus rationale uh, for austerity. It's not the answer. And and how how correct it was. He was talking about uh, Rachel Reeves, who who was in, set to announce billions in austerity cuts after the performance revelation that there was a deficit in public finances. What an absolute scam in the view of. I know we're going to talk about a few things. In fact, uh, we'll just leave it to when we talk about them because uh, we're about to prove the lie as if we had to. So, and here we are now. With I'm sure we'll touch on a number of these uh, uh, policies that are asset stripping the UK and feeding the corporations. Um, as I said, no doubt we'll come on to it. But you look at the Independent when Keir Starmer said, painful. He meant it. Prepare for years of austerity. That's what's happening. The Prime Minister and his Chancellor have already made the, the toughest decision of all, and that's to, to not change the Tory policy. And that's why he's in power, because he's just doing... Ex he wouldn't be in power if he wasn't prepared to do what those who are really in power want. So, no, it's an absolute disgrace. Liars, lies and liars, that's politics these days. And just remember, the only people who are mad at you for speaking the truth are those that are living a lie. Well, uh, I mean, that, that's the thing. You know, they've won this massive landslide because of a first-past-the-post system, Eva. Um, but they won it on lies. I mean, absolute and utter lies all the time. I mean, here's another cracker um, from our, our Annis and his people in Scotland. A thousand pounds off your bills, your electricity, your heat, and your, you know, we're going to just vote for us, land of milk and honey. But now they're trying to, in Scotland, blame the SNP and the Tories, and in England, they're blaming the Tories. In Wales, they're saying nothing mm -hmm. um, uh, except, oh, it's Westminster's fault, it was the Tories' fault. But they just can't be trusted and they lie constantly. And the Scottish people need to waken up because these people will keep lying and keep letting us down. I think it was Alan Bissett in 2014 who referred to if we lose the referendum and we remain part of the UK, that what's going to happen is the Scottish budget, the devolution budget will be squeezed and will be required in Scotland through devolution to continuously mitigate um, for the impact of the policies imposed upon us by Westminster. And Westminster will then blame the Scots and the, the devolved government for not getting things right. And that's exactly where we are. We've seen that already where, you know, the read my lips, no austerity. And one of the very first acts of the Labour Party and government was to reiterate that the two-child rape clause will remain in place, which in effect is penalising some families, third children and beyond. And it makes no sense, either economically or for humanitarian reasons. It is brutal and unnecessarily so, especially because we know that in Scotland, the population is not growing as it should and we need bigger families. We need people to breed more than they are. And we should be encouraging people to have bigger families because coming down the tracks is a demographic nightmare in the context of they're not going to be enough folk to look after the likes of me and Phil in our dotage here in Scotland if we're in nursing homes, care homes, hospitals, because we need many more nurses and care workers than there currently are. The other issue, obviously, which is a political hot potato, are the winter fuel payments. So not content from, in effect, continuing the theft and the deprivation of children and women who were rape victims at one end of the spectrum. At the other end, Labour are, as we've said, removing winter fuel payments from some pensioners. How low is it possible to go? You know, read my lips, there'll be no austerity. What is that if it's not austerity? Because right. what we know is there are hundreds of thousands of pensioners throughout the UK who will lose that benefit, that money, and who are entitled to receive that money. It made the difference for many of them between being able to eat and heat or having to choose one or the other. And what's of fundamental importance is that although pensioners are entitled to apply for pension credit, it is known that many thousands of them don't do it, they don't know how to do it, or they don't know that it even exists. And these people are losing out left, right and centre as a result of this decision made in Westminster. But it affects Scotland because it affects the Barnet formula and it makes a difference to the money that's available within Scotland for the Scottish government. So these are Labour lies 
which will come home to haunt them. But at the moment, they're trying to spin and obfuscate their way around. What was very interesting to see was that every single Labour MP elected in Scotland, I'm not going to call them Scottish Labour because there's no such thing, every Labour MP representing a Scottish constituency who went through those voting lobbies the other night voted in favour of the Labour motion to restrict eligibility for winter fuel payments. There was only two who didn't. They didn't vote against, they didn't abstain, they didn't vote because they weren't there. Ask yourselves why they weren't there. One of them was Ewan Stainbank from Falkirk. I think he, as the youngest MP sitting, the baby of the house, I think he might be, he needs to explain why he wasn't there to vote. What was he doing? Because he should have been there voting against it. The pensioners in his constituency are entitled to know. The other one was a fellow, I think his name was Stevenson. Phil, correct me if I'm wrong, but might he be Adrian Short's MP somewhere in that area? It's not, not a, a name I'm familiar with. His constituents deserve to know too um, what his views are, because these are these are not times for weasel words. These are times when people have to stand up and be counted. So we saw 35 of them showing us the colour of their metal. We, we know the black hearts that they actually are, because they're going to spin this as if it's somehow the fault of the Scottish people or the SNP or that somehow there are resource issues that mean that we can't pay the money. We can't pay the money to the pensioners because it's a political choice not to do so because pensioners in the main can't fight back, don't understand what's going on. So this Labour law, there's a couple of videos actually that are worth watching. Rachel Reeves, when she talks about the unforgettable scene of the pensioner with the purple fingers who was frozen that she would never forget and she would do all her best to look after her. Rachel Reeves, the one that's taking the money away. And the other video is... Keir Starmer from sometime last year when he spoke about his devotion to the pensioners who'd given a life of service to Great Britain and how they deserve to be looked after by, you know, the warm and folding embrace of the benevolent union. These people are not fit to govern because if they lie and they take money away from raped women, children and pensioners, what's the next step going to be? When are they coming for the likes of us? Exactly. But this is it. They lie. Now, everyone goes on about, oh, Boris Johnson was a terrible liar. They watch Starmer out lies him. And that's saying something when you, you're a bigger liar than Boris Johnson. And as, as Eva said, folks, they're trying to blame the SNP in Scotland. This, I'm no lover of the SNP, as you all know, watch this programme regularly. But fair to fair, this is not their, this is not their doing. But here's, here's Starmer, and thanks to Alba for, Alba for this uh, little beauty. Yeah, he pledges to save hundreds of jobs at Scotland's last oil refinery. Grangemouth, Scotland's only refinery, confirmed to close. Yet another lie, um, along with their pension ones. Everything is just a lie with them. And we're going to go through this all the time in tonight's show. The Grangemouth and the pension. The pensioners getting hit, they feel. That's what they're doing. They're lying all the time. Absolutely, and, and I know this is uh, something that uh, Eve is extremely passionate about, uh, given that it's right on her doorstep. So, uh, Grangemouth, the rescue talks have failed, as they were destined to do, people. Um, and Scotland's only major oil refinery closes next year. The decision will mean immediately 400 jobs lost and thousands of others that are uh, will follow. Um, all the support services, all the jobs that rely on Grangemouth, uh, gone. And uh, and the UK and the Scottish and government uh, a package of a hundred million to secure Grangemouth's industrial future was also a bit of a scam, because Petroenial said they were going to end operations, and the sole oil refinery uh, is closing. So. When you think about this, both governments were described. They were describing the decision to change the refinery between was it April and June next year into a fuel import and export on distribution hub as disappointing. They they they, they didn't go for their their saving strategy. It's a nonsense strategy. Honestly, they pledged ten million each in new money. Ten million each. If you know anything about royal oil refineries, we're building FPOs, which is floating uh, in production. Uh, it's basically like it's, a, it's an oil tanker with a small refinery on top connected to the seabed. Five billion, five billion, and you're chunking ten million in each. 
for a full blown oil refinery. It's it's a joke. These people are, are it's a con. They're conning the people here. And this this comes on top of the joint fund of the eighty million in the pre previously announced for Falkirk and Grangemouth growth deals. Which is supporting a plan for bio a bio economy bio economy uh, plan and <coughs> excuse me and uh, I think it was about a nine million low carbon technology centre. It is absolute none not it's an idiot plan. It's a sticking pla plaster over a killer economic blow. That's exactly what it is. It's a half assed attempt by a bunch of lentil munching, sandal wearing tree huggers to save a critical oil refinery in what was the U EU's biggest oil producing region. Should be country, that being Scotland. Ninety six and a half percent of oil of UK oils in Scottish waters and the vast majority of future finds will be in Scottish waters. Why? Because we are, we're, we're currently west of Shetland on some of the big projects I worked on, and we move round, we'll continue to move further west into the Rockall Basin and into the, the Atlantic proper. <coughs> but even though, we need to remember, even though this refinery was making money, it's not enough for the greedy owners. They can make much more by turning this, closing it down, and turning it into this free port, this scam that will further destroy what's left of Scotland's economy. An absolute disgrace. The lies continue, and we're being yeah. duped. Yeah, Grangemouth is one, but here's a couple of things here as well to keep in the theme of what they're saying. And here's a, you know, Starmer. Yeah, here's them. This is and this is from August twenty-two. Uh, Eva. I've met pensioners who have no idea how they'll heat their homes. Parents who will have to skip meals so their kids can eat. The Tories are too busy fighting each other to notice. Labour has a plan that meets the scale of this crisis. Oh, what's that plan? Cut the winter fuel payment, close down Grangemouth, create, and it's not 400 jobs, as you found out earlier and sent me a, a thing through Eva. It's over 2,000 jobs. You know, take away the pensioners' money. Don't give money to, to, to women with three children. Is that is that his was that his plan all along? It certainly looks that way. I mean, we're we're, we're talking about labour lies, but what's really important is I like people to know the truth, and I think that it's significant that there's probably quite a lot of folk in Scotland don't understand what happened at Grangemouth and why Grangemouth exists in the first place. It's because the very first oil um, processing in the world was Young's Paraffin Light Oil Company, based in Bathgate, not very far from Grangemouth. And it was the success of, of Paraffin, James Paraffin Young, and a workforce that was acknowledged to be extremely skilled in that area, that meant when there was oil to be processed, Grangemouth was chosen as the right location, in part because of the workforce, obviously, who had been trained and taught by James Paraffin Young and those around him, and clearly, access through the River Forth was extremely important too. Now, I I wrote a blog about this the other day and what I in, intended to do, I kind of got sidetracked and went down a bit of a rabbit hole looking at other famous Scots that probably a lot of modern day Scots have never heard about. And I would suggest that everybody watching the programme just Googles Scottish inventors or Scottish achievements because what is brutally plain is that for hundreds of years, Scotland was blessed, overly populated with entrepreneurs, scientists, people who invented and discovered and built and created. And what they did was what Jim Sellers said about Ian Lawson. They didn't require a box to think out of. The box didn't exist. And that's what Scotland needs today, to be served by people of vision and imagination and knowledge and ability. And that is not what we've got in either Holyrood's um, government at the moment, or more particularly at Westminster. There is no vision, there is no imagination, there is no courage. There is a series of sound bites. And particularly from Keir Starmer, what you've got constantly is something that's said for expediency as if he's made it up on the hoof a couple of lines and he's out the door and before and after his speech all of his lieutenants all of his trustees are repeating his words like they're some sort of fantastic powerful all-consuming um omnipotent mantra when the truth of the matter is it's like the wizard of oz at the end you pull back the curtain and there's a wee guy sitting there absolutely clueless 
because what Starmer is doing is not delivering a single socialist minded policy, not at all. He's called a red Tory for a reason and he's worse than the blue Tories because he is utterly dishonest. You know that he and Rachel Reeves claimed that they had to stop the winter fuel payment. They had to restrict that back because otherwise it would have caused some sort of crash in the economy. What kind of utter guff is that? They've paid far more or pledged far more this week when David Lammy visited Ukraine towards Ukraine in addition to what's already gone than it would have cost to keep the winter fuel payments as they were. So this yeah. is about priorities. It's about what he thinks he can get away with. I mean, a really scary thing is, Starmer's not even in the UK just now. He's in Washington, D.C. for a meeting with Joe Biden. Who in their right mind bothers their backside speaking to Joe Biden just now? There's no point. The guy doesn't know if he's up or he's down. And he's not going to be in his job for very much longer. He has no influence. His intellect is very badly damaged. But Starmer's over there meeting somebody. And what he's meeting them just now about is making decisions about things that are going to happen in the next few weeks because Biden's out of a job within a couple of months. So Starmer is very much one the worst that worth the watching because he's allied himself completely and totally with the Americans. And that for the UK and for Scotland particularly is very bad news. Yeah, it's very scary news, and we're going to come on to that because actually all of this could be quite irrelevant. We could all be toast. Um, we could all be nuked in a few weeks with the way things are going. A couple of things here on our, uh, our Labour Chancellor. Um, um, and here's, a, here's a, an absolute cracker. You know, uh, you know, she, we can't pay anything to the pensioners and the poorest in our society, but she claimed £4,400 in energy support before she axed the fuel payments to fill. Ah. Uh, is that a bit of hypocrisy? It just is, sums up the Labour Party and their dishonesty. Yeah, and, and the ensuing fallout is is obviously pricking the conscience of at least some of those Labour representatives who remember what Labour used to stand for. Because, um, you know, the, the, the fallout from this uh, winter fuel payment has been pretty deep and pretty serious uh, and and the other thing we should remember and all the, the all these cuts and all these problems we've got the the money that Scotland gets for its annual budget is only return of part of the money we pay into the Treasury and it's reduced in real terms year after year but here we are these not only skim, skimming off the top for themselves they're cutting essential payments to people while hysteria continues to crack up it's a crank up it's absolutely absolutely appalling. I mean, this is how devolution is destroying Scotland and the foolish Scottish government that continues to play the British game. We should be fighting Barnet, we should be fighting fuel poverty, we should be fighting jars. But no, there was a good article in the Financial Times, I think it was Anna Goss and George Parker, and uh, they were talking about the, the, the Labour pressured one of their MPs to withdraw a motion on winter fuel payments. It was Neil Duncan Jordan's petition calling for a delay to ending the support for pensioners and the the whip acting for Keir um, obviously pressured the new Labour MP to withdraw a motion brought into the House of Commons uh, that calls for uh, the scrap in the winter fuel payments and that would be the, the absolute minimum you should be doing is to rethink this and look at the impact it was having and this was some conscience from within the Labour Party and what happened of course the whips stepped in and uh, the guy was put under massive pressure okay that's their job but the bottom line is the scrapping of the winter fuel payments for pensioners is the dis pensioners is the disgrace here, an absolute disgrace. And for me, this is just another sign that these lies will continue. That Labour have got in based on lies, and we are we're going to continue to suffer. And the Scottish people and the most vulnerable in our society are the ones that are going to pay most for it. They're so it, it's so consistent with exactly what the Tories have been doing. So the Red Tories, right enough, it's an out-and-out -out disgrace what's happening in Britain right now, and Scotland is bearing the brunt, as our temperatures, as we know, are the lowest in Britain. Now, here's a couple of things. You, you've been in where you understand these things. Now, this wasn't in the manifesto, um, and it's only meant to be the things that can be in the manifesto so that you can be whipped on. And that's a sort of a precedent. It's not a, you know, a written rule, but it is the precedent. If it's not in the manifesto, backbenchers are allowed to vote with their conscience. 
but he turned us in to uh, use the whips to make sure they were all whipped through to support it. Is that isn't that correct? Yeah, yeah, and and it's uh, it's crazy when you think about it to withdraw an early day motion after it's been published and and has already gained signatures is 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 really rare. I mean, it, it indicates just, you know, how seriously the government is taking this because we should bear in mind that this is damaging Labour's sales, glib sales sound bites that they are for the people because clearly they're not for the people. And they have to be a sense. It's like the support for Israel and what's going on there. They've had to backstep a wee bit and rewind. So to do something like this, I mean, there was 10 Labour MPs at least, I think, and, and, and it was obviously the ones on the more left of the party, like Clive Lewis and Kim Johnson, um, and some of, the, some of the newer members. They signed this motion, which aims to delay the measure. And to have that level, uh, to, to do that when it's been published, is, is not unheard of, but it's very, very irregular. So they are very worried about this, and particularly the, the damage to the image of Labour, of what they perceive um, Labour's image to be. But as we've said all along, politics is the management of perception. Yeah, uh, here's this one, but I'd like you to look at this. This is, this is a classic. You know, the, when they're trying to get elected, you know, the, the, as I say, Labour always promised you the land of milk and honey, they're full of great ideas. But this was a beautiful ambush. I loved it. Quote here from a pretty prominent economist, and they say that Labour need to provide an alternative to aggressive policies being prioritised by the Conservatives. The banks and those earning more than £100,000 could quite easily contribute a little more, and unless they do, inequality and poverty will inevitably soar in the months and years ahead. Do you agree with that statement? The way that I believe that you can reduce uh, inequality, reduce poverty, and actually also improve the living standards of ordinary working people, not in poverty, but struggling to get by, is through growing the economy. You know the economist that she quoted? That was actually you. Uh, well, look, I mean, I want to reduce poverty and inequality. I didn't go into politics. But how do you do that? What are the practical well, things that we can do? Well, your suggestion in that quote was to tax the banks more and those earning more than £100,000 more. But you've gone back on that. Well, look, the way that I think that we can lift people out of poverty and reduce inequality, as I say, is to get the economy growing. As slippery as a new lever. Absolutely, you know, caught banker rights. Well, oh yeah, but I was I was facing that way, but now I'm facing this way, and it's, that's this is the way. Everything's right. I was right then. I'm right now, and I'm always right. Uh -huh. And I've never been wrong, and I've never contradicted myself. Never. Exactly. Um, th this is just what it is in the main to be a politician who is desperate to to cling to control, and that's what she's doing. She's she's there, over promoted. Dare I say? Um, not fit for the job, not fit for purpose. And what is really pretty damning is there was an opinion poll out within the last day or two that shows you that the wheels are indeed coming off the bus because in the course of the last week, Labour's popularity has slumped by six points. For Westminster, they're now on 29% and the Tories are on 25%. So there's a lesson for the Scots in particular who might be thinking about lending Labour their vote in 2026 or hopefully earlier when the next holiday election is. Vote for the people that you trust. Vote for the people that you think will be honest with you, who have integrity and who will tell you what they're going to do and stick to it. Because it's abundantly clear that that is not the Labour Party either um, within Westminster or in Holyrood. I thought this was going to be a moment with Rachel Reeves when she was talking about poverty and inequality that she was going to quote Anna Sarwar and refer to him having said that the route out of poverty is work um, because that was one of the most inane, ignorant um, phrases I've ever heard a politician come out with. But on the what subject... Exactly. Um, but on the subject of Labour lies and, you know, facing one way and then to other, the hard fact of the matter is during the campaign in the general election, there were only two sets of hustings for the Allo and Grangemouth constituency where I stood. And obviously, um, one of my competitors, one of the fellow candidates was Kenny McCaskill. It was a delight to listen to Kenny being passionate, fired up and speaking absolutely from his heart and also from his brain with that massive intellect talking about the economy, Grangemouth, its importance, fuel, how much is coming out of the North Sea, why we need to keep it in Scotland, how it is that talking about closing the Grangemouth refinery is indeed a national disaster and it is, you know, vandalism 
writ large. But while Kenny was making those speeches and, you know, every every eye, every ear in the audience was upon him and people were wrapped, engaged, listening to every word, Brian Leishman, the Labour candidate who became elected and is now my MP, he was there saying to folk, well, I'm part of a great big party. You're not wanting to be voting for, you know, some almost, he didn't use these words, but he meant almost an entity like me who was an independent or Kenny, who had, you know, a smaller party that he was representing in Alba Party. Vote for me, I'm Labour, we're big shots. You're better being a supporter of the big boys because we're the folk that can deliver the goods for you because voting Labour will keep Grange Mouth open. Well, watch, read my lips. Voting Labour is clearly not keeping Grange Mouth Refinery open. And it's perfectly clear that Brian Leishman, as the local MP for Grange Mouth, does not have the ear of any of his bosses because if he did the press releases that are being made now by Labour in Scotland and Labour at Westminster are not talking about retaining the refinery they refer to a just transition they refer to their hearts are with and their thoughts are with the workers and it's 400 jobs and we'll do the best that we can because they lied when they said voting Labour keeps Grange mouth open Voting Labour never did that in Bathgate and never did it in Linwood. It didn't do it in all the places that the proclaimers sing about. And it never will because Labour is a unionist party and their hearts lie firmly in Westminster within the union. That's why Indeed. they lie. Indeed. There's six refineries in the UK, folks. Five are in England. They're all getting uh, upgraded to make up for the, the slack that's going to come from closing down the one in the oil producing part of the United Kingdom. The only place that produces the oil is getting closed. Disgraceful. But on these two themes, uh, uh, Phil, here's one, you know, they're trying to make it sound like a household budget and you've got to make your ends meet. As we know, that's when it comes to countries. That was something that Thatcher started trying to pretend it's like a, a household budget. It's a nonsense. But on that theme, here's this. If the living wage is 25 grand a year, why is it the state pension at the top end is 11 and a half grand and doesn't deserve a wee bit of help? And remember the one I popped earlier, folks, where Rachel Reeves, the Chancellor, she got £4,400 just for heating. That's not including her 91 grand a year or 161 she gets in total for the Chancellor or her unlimited expenses or subsidised food, all that stuff. The state pension. These are the people that are hitting the Labour Party, the Labour Party, so. Yeah, I mean, that, that's appalling. I mean, we all know that the pension is is the worst in, 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 in Europe and certainly in the Western world. At one point, we were a little bit ahead of Mexico, but guess what? The Mexicans now pay their pensioners more relatively than we do. And that's in Mexico where uh, it's not expensive to live for uh, most folk. So, no, it's an absolute uh, disgrace that we in Scotland, we in, in, in the West are now, it's come to this, Eleven and a half thousand on a pension. The pensioners are struggling. It, 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 the stories are horrific. What's out there, and everybody knows someone. And you, you, you live in some of the more de, de, deprived areas in in Scotland. You you can see it. If you're in the front line, if you're a taxi driver, police, social services, teachers, anybody who deals with with folk on a day-to-day -day basis, or folk, the, the rise of food banks is horrific. The number of people that are, are relying on handouts. And this is the thing. There's a lot of very uh, successful people who, when you make a wee bit of money, you think, well, maybe I'll do my wee bit and uh, do a bit of charity work. And, and that's all well and good. But people don't want your charity. People want dignity. People want opportunity. And remember the Gini coefficient. What we need is, is a fairer society where people get a crack at the whip. And that's not happening in Britain. It's getting, it's going completely the wrong way. As we knew it would. As we told you it would. That's why we fought for an independent Scotland in 2014. And that's why the betrayal of Nicola and her cabal is even more hard-hitting. It bites to the core. It hurts. It hurts our people, our friends, our family, our, our, the people in your society, the people in your communities. And these communities are disintegrating. Crime's on the rise. Drug use is on the rise. It's a hell of a state of affairs. And it's entirely due to the, 
to the government, mismanagement of the government, and the greed of those who control the politicians. Look at that turn by Rachel Reeves. I mean, absolutely appalling. When she was an economist with no probably no uh, expectation of being a, a chancellor or, or being in senior position in government. She made those quotes. Why? Because it's true. You know, and then she goes back on them because, well, she's t she says what she's paid to say. The 4,400 is just a drop in the ocean for the money she's getting for doing what she's doing, for uh, selling out in your principles. Absolutely appalling. And uh, it continues all over Britain. It continues all over the world. And it, it, it seconds us. And what we need is a smaller, more nimble, more active. That's, that's the thing about a, a, a parliament in Westminster. It, uh, it is not accessible. Whereas the one in Edinburgh will be much more accessible to the people. Um, that's why we've got to get independence. And we have got to get out of this as soon as possible. And that means... More pain for the SNP. I can see it coming when you look at this SNP budget. We'll, we'll, we'll probably talk about that later. But absolutely disgusted with the state of affairs just now. And that pension and the fact that the winter fuel, fuel payments are, are dropped and the corporations continue to make record profits, particularly the energy companies, people wake up, bring on the revolution. Yeah, of course. Uh, Starmer's trying to, I mean, I've got to, he's trying to blame the pensioner. That's what he's been doing. What is Labour something. doing to support our pensioners? The Conservatives left Britain with a £22 billion black hole in public finances this year. That's why the Labour government is taking the tough decisions now to fix the foundations of our economy so that we can rebuild Britain and make every part of the country better off. But this Labour government will make sure that no one is left behind. That's why the most vulnerable pensioners will still have access to the winter fuel payment. And the government is working closely with charities like Age UK to make sure that everyone has access to the benefits that they're entitled to. In the coming years, pensioners will continue to see their pensions increase as part of the Labour government's commitment to the triple lock. The triple lock means that pensions increase by £900 this year alone. The Labour government will always be honest about the public finances, but make no mistake, the changes made by this parliament will make people across our country better off and fix the mess the Tories left behind. That is an absolute load of lies, because only certain people are going to get the 900, and they're trying to make out, oh, well, we're giving you this pay, not till April, not after the winter, mm -hmm. not till after the winter. And there's a, a report out where they say up to 4,000 pensioners could die this winter, mm -hmm. and they know it, they were told it. But here's the other thing, Eva, on that, where they're lying about, oh, no one's getting left behind, we spoke about it last week. There's a 220 questionnaire mm -hmm. for those who have to get on uh, the to get the, the pension credit. But here's what Starmer's now after the election. After the election, of course. Uh, now, where are we here? I've got it here. Where is he? Where is he? Where are you? Oh, yes, here you are. Pensioners don't need the winter fuel payment, says Starmer. But now, the, one of the things they're putting out there, Eva, is that the pensioners are rich. They've got plenty of money. Because what they're alluding to is a lot of these people who have retired have now paid off their house for sure. So if you like, they're asset rich. Mm -hmm. But they're not they're not they've not they're not cash rich. I wonder how many millionaires he thinks there are in places like Clipman and Shire, and how many of those millionaires are pensioners. Um what is interesting in this regard is guess how much you are supposed to have as your weekly income to get your pension credit and give you, as a single person, the amount of money the government thinks you should have to live on. It's £218.15 pence a week for a single person, for a pensioner living on his or her own. £218.15 a week. How on earth can you live on that, pay your gas, pay your electricity, Buy your messages. Maybe you need a pair of shoes, a couple of pairs of socks, a warm jersey. Maybe you need to buy household goods. Maybe you're needing pots and pans, all this sort of stuff. It is absolutely impossible to live with a reasonable standard of living on that level of income. You know, gone are the days when pensioners used to be able to subsidise 
the younger members of the family. It's the other way about now. The younger members are trying to subsidise some pensioners and they can't do it because younger, especially single working people, are also doing very badly. This government is completely out of touch. They created fairy stories prior to the election. Their manifesto was junk. And what they've done since being elected is to roll back as much as they possibly can and to rene renege on promises that were previously made. But none of that should be a surprise because that's what Labour do. Cast mm -hmm. your mind back to Tony Blair and the multitude of issues that there were with his governance and also Gordon Brown's, whether it was the gold or the pensions raids or the illegal wars, that's what you get with Labour, constant lies. As you said at the very beginning, you know what you get with the Tories, you know what to expect. Labour, full of surprises insofar as you know that they'll be less than honest, you're just not sure where they're going to be targeting or who they're going to be targeting first. But make no mistake, in the end, we'll all be targeted with the exception of the high earners that they refuse, steadfastly refuse, to increase taxation for. Yep. I mean, we had Alec Neil on here last week talking about things that could be done to raise money immediately. The TUC, the lady from the TUC, was talking about, you know, taxes on the 1%, which would get rid of the black hole overnight, just raising a 1% increase on the top rate would get them. But no, they won't do that. But this is what you alluded to there, this, the cut to the winter fuel um, payment could cut, and it was under Labour's own research fill that 400 pensioners will die but they did it anyway. Yeah, four thousand. It's and and the other thing is this 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 is economics. Rachel Reeves knows this very well, and it goes back to that article I was mentioned earlier in the in the Canary, um, in July twenty four, because Rachel Reeves, when she was announcing the billions of austerity cuts after after she pretended, she, I mean, she said she's I'm genuinely shocked when someone says I'm genuinely shocked. It's because they're lying about it to emphasise the fact that they knew all along. She's an economist, for God's sake. She knew about it, and the the international, the IFS, had already in the I think it was in the March months before announced about this twenty billion black hole. And any economist worth their salt understands exactly where Britain's been going for quite a long time now. So no, absolute liar. And austerity is not the answer. That is the thing. That's what. That's the thing that that bites hardest. This woman is a barefaced liar. Everybody knows more austerity does not work. What you need is the opposite of austerity. You need government spending, investment in infrastructure. You need government policies that are generating jobs, creating industry, not shutting industries down and screwing pensioners into the ground. And, and, what, and what, what for our future, for our children's future in a country like this? It's absolutely appalling. It. We are responsible for this, people. We allowed this to happen, and it's up to us to do something about it. So the first thing you can do is get out. Or I hope you. I hope you were all under one banner. You know that for starters, you need to be standing up. We need to stand up and be counted. It's long, long overdue. Words, words fail me now. Uh, it's it's getting desperate. It has been for a long time, and I harken back to that moment after the hollowness when we lost in 2014, and the wee guy in George Square that 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 summed it up for me because I was feeling exactly the same thing. I'm thinking, bring it on, bring on the pain. Well, here it is, folks. More and more pain, layers and layers, and years and years of pain and suffering for the most vulnerable in our society. And you and I, we are responsible for not getting us the hell out of this, this unequal union. We really need to stand up to these shysters. And anybody that pretends that they're doing good voted Labour, you didn't win. You're a clown if you think you won because you backed the right horse. You're in, it's a losing game. And until we get out of this union, we'll continue to be suffer in this losing game. It's enraging. It is, because it's new Liberal governments we've had since 1979. And in 2008, how could you have forgotten, folks? Why do you think we got rid of the Labour Party in 2010? It was because the crash of 2008, Gordon Brown, as the Chancellor, a history graduate who was held up as some sort of financial genius, he was a history graduate. He had no background in finance, and he screwed it over. The bankers were still paying for it. And every year since then, the Holyrood budget, in real terms, has been cut and cut and cut, and they'll keep cutting it. And they'll, they're making an industrial wasteland. But what they won't do, Eva, 
because they can find money for things they love. Now, here's a picture of two warmongers. Lamy, who the man who received £70,000 of a donation from an Israeli lobbyist, and Anthony Blinken, who has a, an Israeli passport as well. They find money for Israel to kill children and women and innocents in Gaza. They've just given another £600 million this this week, over and above the three million, three billion rather, they've already given to Ukraine. They can find money to kill. It's the old story. They can find money for bombs, but know the bairns. Prior to Tony Blair's government, that's not something that you would tend to say very often about the Labour Party or a Labour government, but it seems to have become second nature for them. I'll tell you something. David Lammy is an international laughingstock. Um, I have absolutely no faith or confidence in him whatsoever because, remember, he's the guy that said men can have ovaries and cervixes and what have you. Um, so thankfully, there's been some events this week that have discredited that opinion. But, you know, th this just goes to show what the priorities are. And it's what I said earlier. Priority for Keir Starmer at the moment is, is to be in Washington speaking to Joe Biden and others around him. They still have this imperial attitude. They think they're a big shot in the world stage. And this is one of the reasons why they don't want to let go of Scotland, because they can pretend to be a big shot with nuclear weapons on the Clyde, because I'm damn sure... When Scotland's independent and those nuclear weapons are no longer there, they're not hugely likely to be sailed up the Thames to be parked outside the Palace of Westminster, are they? And they're not going to be housed down in Portsmouth or Plymouth or wherever else. So for that reason alone, for sucking into the Yanks in respect to the nuclear deterrent, they want to hold on to Scotland. They don't want to be diminished internationally by losing the northern outpost. So this performance internationally it's not about what's best for the people of the united kingdom it's not best what's it's not about what's best for the people of ukraine or russia or palestine or israel it's about reputations and performing like you know almost like strutting peacocks um wanting the attention of the world to be upon their eyes when they should be at home looking after the people that elected them to do a job and the job they were elected to do was to deliver on their promises it was about no more austerity. It was about social policy and social welfare, redistribution, egalitarianism, all the buzzwords that were in the manifesto of the founding fathers of the Labour Party and they're wheeled out prior to every election and forgotten about immediately afterwards. Um, I think that they might be in government for a while, but they will eventually lose and they'll be in opposition for a long time again after that. But in the meantime, Scotland needs to do what we can to get the hell out of there as quickly as is humanly possible. And, you know, in, in that regard, I, I really enjoyed last week listening to Alec Neil talking because he was very constructive about what could be done, um, obviously, particularly about the economy and housing and what we can do in Scotland with a budget that we've got, albeit that, that it is a constrained and a restricted one. And there are lots of things that the Scottish government can still do because we need to get back to competent government in Scotland so we can prove to the people of Scotland that we can govern ourselves, albeit that our purse strings are controlled from Westminster. So John Swinney's got a bit of a battle in his hands in that regard because the economic advisors around about him and the people in his cabinet that are supposed to deal with the Scottish economy are probably not playing one entirely complete deck. So I would suggest that it's high time that John looked around himself and he took advice, especially this week, from Alex Salmond and Kenny McCaskill, who know about energy, know about Grangemouth. Alec kept Grangemouth open twice in the past when there were issues there. Kenny's got the facts and figures at his fingertips. He should speak to Alec Neil about the economy and about housing. He should speak to some medics about the NHS. And he should almost create a cabinet of advisors that, that borders upon being like a government, a national unity, a sort of coalition of the men and the women who might be in the grey coats or the grey kilts, but they know what they're talking about and they've got expertise and knowledge that can be put to good use in Scotland because for as long as we're thrilled to Westminster, life in Scotland is only going to get worse unless and until we've got good people with knowledge and power and understanding actually standing up for us and delivering what the people of Scotland need and deserve. I agree with you. I don't think the union's ever been weaker. And if we could get united... Scotland, Scotland movement, we could be out of here. Because I'm going to come on to it a minute about the SNP losing a couple of votes 
and it could trigger an election. We're going to come on to that in a minute. But I'd like to round off on the Ukraine and because uh, none of us might be here in a few weeks, Phil, because Lamy, uh, the reason that one of the reasons Stammer didn't over talk to Joe Biden, and so I'm here to see Joe Biden and Joe Biden going, yeah, me too. Who is he? I mean, this guy is, uh, God love him, he's, he's not right. But they're talking about these missiles. They want to allow long-range missiles. Now, Putin, who doesn't bluff, has said that will be a red line. If you do that, then you can expect to be hit back in your countries. We could all be nuked tomorrow. For what, Phil? Is, is, that's what gets me. He's sacrificing pensioners to give money to Ukraine to go and fight a war. They're sacrificing the, the three child, the two child cap to give money to Ukraine. Why? What is it about Russia and what is it about Ukraine that they're willing to risk World War III? I don't understand it. It's not so much Israel in um, Ukraine. It's profit, plain and simple. This is the military-industrial complex that Eisenhower warned us of. And if you read his, his autobiography written by his daughter, I believe, <clears throat> I haven't read it all, but I've, I've read excerpts from it. And he was more of a general than he was a politician, and yet he was president of the United States. And he came out and said that you have to be very careful here, very, very careful, because what we've got is an organization, a very powerful lobby that is making weapons to make money. And what, you, what we now have is a, is, a, is a Russian and Chinese military that are making weapons to kill people, because that's that was the original design of weapons. The reason the West is dominant, let's not forget this, because we tend to forget it, but the rest of the world doesn't. The reason the West, and I can't remember who said it recently, I saw a quote, I thought it was excellent. Uh, the reason the West is dominant is because we were better at organised violence. That's what it comes down to. You know, I've, I've just been reading Guns, Germs and Steel, an excellent book, well worth a read to understand how it, how humanity developed in different areas. But what it comes down to, who has the, the whip hand? Well, who, who, who does hold the whip hand? It's the strongest and the, the most aggressive and those that are successful in battle. So we are now in a situation where the UK is given another, what is that, 800 million worth of support for for Ukraine. David Lamy couldn't agree more. The guy is a chancellor, blinking, warmonger, complete hawk in America in Kiev to reiterate this nonsense support that's a lie. And and we're cutting and for a fraction of, of what they've we've given Ukraine we could we could look after our, our own and put the winter fuel payments back up, increase child benefits, uh build, start start spending. Look after your own. Put your own house in order. What we're doing now is looking after the lobbyists and the corporations. And we, the other thing that we need to remember here, this incursion into Kursk, <clears throat> we need to remember this. NATO invaded Russia. NATO invaded Russia. This force that was invaded and trained and supplied by NATO, the, the, who planned the attack and, and using NATO intelligence and reconnaissance, and, and actually, there were some uh, people uh, who were involved, and it was mostly Ukrainians, from what uh, our sources tell us. Um, but there were there were Polish, there were French, there were others from NATO countries in, in uniform. And, and when, when I say that, it's something I talked about before. We really need to look for alternative sources of information. Look at listen to what Scott Ritter is saying. Uh, the ex uh, weapons inspector, Matt Weapons. He was one. He was the, one of the main guys going into uh, Iraq looking for weapons of mass destruction. Look at the grey zone. Listen to Colonel Douglas McGregor. Look at John Mearsheimer. Listen to the Duran, Alexander Mercurius, Alex Christoforou. Listen to Al Jazeera. Do you know what? Even listen to Tass, the Moscow Times RT. If you want a balanced opinion, usually you need to listen to both sides of the argument and settle probably somewhere in between what he said, what she said, and what the truth is. Somewhere in the middle. But unless you, if you only listen to the mainstream media, you will not get the truth, folks. And this is the problem here. We are, we are risking the destruction of humanity for profit for the few. And, and what is being done in your name you need to wake up. You really need to wake up. What particularly uh, it, it was happening in Ukraine is very, very dangerous, but Israel as well. Israel, 
I will, you know, it's a shame Lloyd's not here. He could give us a far more detailed insight of what's happening there. But honestly, folks, we need to pay attention to those who are not mainstream and check out your sources. Read and listen to the alternative view. There, 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 there are other opinions out there and you need to consider them both and I have long since stopped believing the western mainstream media because it's lies and we are risking the death the death of the whole planet it's, it's absolutely horrific and we need to wake yeah. up and the people who start the war they've got nuclear fallout shelters although I don't know what they're going to come out to if this all kicks off but they'll be safe in their shelters well you and your wife and your children and your grandchildren or whatever are fried. That's what these people are doing and for what? For profit? For money? Because there's no there's no sense around it. There's no sense around to any war. You have to negotiate. And the aggressor, we're not the good guys. We're the aggressors. The West are the aggressors. That's a fact. But anyway, I think we need to get out of the British Union. We all do in this show. But uh, I'd like to come on to that in a minute because I would like to talk about the, the votes that the, the SNP lost this week. But before that, uh, Eva, I'd like you on this because this is a one of the reasons why the SNP is in such a bloody mess because they stopped working on independence and worked on the woke nonsense. But some it's coming home to roost. Mm -hmm. And here this week, a statement from the Rape Crisis Centre Board um, have decided it's time for a change of leadership. As she stood down, stood down. She, he, it stood down. He should have been fired. He should never have had the job in the first place. You know, if he has got a penis and testicles, he's a man. Well, it doesn't he matter whether he's wearing a sari or whatever he is. Um, it, he was a man. He should never have had the job in the first place, should he? Either? Not at all. He lied to get it because he didn't disclose that he was male. Um, it would have been abundantly clear to those who interviewed him that he was male. Um, it's abundantly clear to anybody that's ever met him that he's male. Um, and the fact that there are innumerable press releases still referring to him using female pronouns is absolutely pathetic. We should be telling the truth. You know, the minute that we walk away from truth and we deal instead in fantasies and fairy stories, the game's a bogey. Um, and it's been a bogey for several years as the result of this ideology. And I cannot for the life of me understand how it was that otherwise sensible, intelligent people were so very badly captured. Nothing, nothing will ever enable a human being to change sex. It is not possible. It will not happen. Everybody knows this. The men who say that they are trans women know that they are men. They insult us by using phrases like live as a woman. It is pathetic. It is wrong and it has no place in political discourse. What we ought to have done instead is roll back right to the very beginning of this ideology and been able to say, hold the bus. We should have facilities and services that are single sex for men and for women and separately have facilities and rights for people who say that they're trans. That is not rocket science. That is a very civilised way of dealing with matters. But instead, we had lies, we had Stonewall Law, we had innumerable organisations, civil servants, Scottish Government advisors, misinterpreting the law, I suggest, on purpose, by, by claiming that self-ID, in essence, was already the law. That was very clear this week too in the Scottish Parliament when there were issues regarding how Police Scotland record the sex of accused persons because it's become clear that crimes committed by men are being recorded as crimes committed by women and that has included apparently rapes and sexual assaults. When John Swinney was, was challenged about this, he said it's an operational matter for the police and the government cannot interfere in this. That's utter nonsense. Not an operational matter, it's the law. The police ought not to be implementing self-ID because it's not the law. We know that because of what happened to Gender Recognition Reform. But the awful shame and the absolute disaster of Mridal Wadwa, his influence, the influence of others around him, is that there have been people, women, who were very badly injured, harmed, abused and traumatised, who were not able to get the single sex service that they require as abused women because it became clear that if you contacted Edinburgh Rape Crisis, you might be confronted with Mriddle, a man as, a, as an advisor or a therapist, 
or you might be in group therapy where some of the staff and some of the other victims who were there for therapy were not female but were male and the atmosphere according to the report that's out this week the atmosphere was incredibly poor and very badly managed and badly run and that was down not just to middle wadwa but to those who employed him and top of that tree of employers remains maggie chapman the green msp who was a worker employed chief executive chief officer whatever she was with edinburgh rape crisis when the decision was made to hire middle wadwa so maggie chapman i suggest is not fit to be an msp she ought not to be in Holyrood, and she certainly should not be part of any government of scotland in future yeah, you've also missed out Nicola Sturgeon, who very much was a sponsor of this guy and who promoted him and who took photographs for them and was happy to hold him up as some kind of object of, to, to look up to. So she's also guilty. Mm -hmm. But that's the point here. I, I, everyone I've met, you know, the strongest friends, people who are, are fighting for women's rights, no one's saying you shouldn't be allowed to be trans. Everyone's saying the same. I say the same. If you want to dress up and call yourself Shirley, Go knock yourself out. Well, I've been up. People of age, do what you like, but don't expect me and the rest of the world to say, yeah, you're a woman, because you're not. You're a guy. But if you're happy doing that, it's just like, if you've got a religion and it makes you happy, I'm happy for you. Don't force it on me. I'm not going to admit to it. And that's the problem. And that's what's brought down the SNP, Phil. Now, I go back to what I said earlier. We're running out of time, but the union has never been weaker. We need to unite. We need to get out before there's a nuclear war, before pensioners start dying of coal, before we lose our refinery, before we lose all of our oil, and then they'll come for our water. Then what will they come? Once they've got our water, they can start making whiskey and call it Scottish whiskey and steal it as well. So, folks, we need to unite. That's exactly the key, isn't it, Phil? We need to unite. And, to, you know, and hope over fear is a good place to start. Oh, 100 percent that's what that's where it belongs um the unification that we've talked about for a very long time <clears throat> and unfortunately the the great thing about 2014 is it was every stripe was represented in this wonderful movement the yes movement and we were tolerant of each other and and that is no no longer the case because we've been infiltrated the smp or champion has been infiltrated it wasn't difficult there's there's so many half wits in, in the smp and when power when you become a very powerful organization i would not have been an mp if the prospect of winning coat bridge was seen as real i would not have been because that would have been reserved for someone who was in the club and the reality is that's how politics work. I, I, I wasn't used in oil and gas, even though I had more experience than everyone else there put together, uh, or construction, although there's another good engineer there. Um, there we, we, didn't, we didn't use those who they didn't know and trust. Even though we knew more about the subject, if you weren't trained and you weren't, ready to speak what they want you to say then you weren't put into power or put in any position where you might embarrass them now I, i'm okay with that up to a point the the unification but that what what i'm against is us continuing to fight a losing battle and we are we're we're getting to the stage where it will be important it is now i believe almost impossible to balance the budget in scotland you cannot you cannot continue to take less and less money in a world of increasing prices and 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 make sense of it. Yes, some of the stuff that Alex came out with last week, uh, Alec Neil came out with was very good, and the stuff that we've talked about, we know we do need a competent government, but the focus has got to be on the unification and escaping from this union. I mean, the Edinburgh rape crisis is... is it's just one more example of it. I mean, some of the some of the statements when I read this were, were horrific. You know, the charity paused new referrals to the centre and said it was extremely concerned that women-only spaces had not been provided for 16 months in a rape crisis centre. You complete morons. How would you feel? As 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 I know this is it's something that even I know we're all passionate about it's an absolute disgrace and, and and there's something else that stuck out to me for women scotland 
which has campaigned against changes to transgender rights. And yeah, and I would echo what you said, Roddy. We support transgender rights. There are genuine transgender people out there who are, who are, and it's a hell of a thing to go through. But there's also people who are preying on these these stupid laws, and uh, and that that's what we're trying to protect. But for women in Scotland, camp, uh, they they campaigned against changes to transgender rights. They accused the board of ignoring its own culpability, and that's something Eve t- Eva touched on. They have to be held to account, and they, uh, you know, it's like even when a, a Conservative MSP Sue Weber's quote and that her quote I'm going to read. While the ERCC board have been forced by the independent review to accept that a change of leadership is necessary, the perfunctory apology in the statement suggests they still don't grasp the magnitude of the offence and upset they have caused. Uh, horrific, absolutely horrific, and that's just a, a list. We, we, we haven't even talked about the, the SNP budget. You know, it, it, with the, there's so much to be going on here. There's so much going on here. The unification is critical. These clowns in the SNP still represent what most people think or assume to be the forefront of the independence movement. And that has been a massive problem for us. They have dis- they've not destroyed it. They've given the unionists uh, a, an open goal to criticise independence and to say it can't work. Because when you get idiots like... Uh, I mean, everybody since Nicola and everybody in that cabal needs to be removed. We will do that list. They will get removed. They need to be banned from politics um, or certainly put to the back row. Go earn your stripes again. Go out there and fight for independence. Go off the gravy train. In fact, we need to rip them off the gravy train and deconstruct the SNP and rebuild from the... There's a, there's a line from Kipling. You know, it, it would be... Um, I wouldn't say it, it, this could be very wrong for the. This could go very, very wrong for the SNP. The way things are going, if they're forced to call an election, they will be decimated. As I sadly believe, they have to be bankrupted and deconstructed so we can oust the remaining shysters and rebuild the SNP for the people or anything else. Rudyard, Rudyard Kipling's "If" springs to mind. Watch the things you've given your life to broken and stoop down and build them up with worn out tools. That's what we've got to do again, sadly. Yeah. One thing that got me a lot quite, quite some time ago, and it's men, don't, don't care if you're wearing lippy dresses, no, I'm living like a woman. Men have never had to cross the street because they see a man coming, right. worried, change their route home, mm-hmm. um, felt that fear. You know, Men, we don't experience it. We don't feel those things. Um, and I'm sure Eva could a whole program and all of that easily but, but the, just a couple of things because this week Eva as well because we're running out of time the SNP suffered two defeats one on uh, bringing back in the, the rail fares the prime rail fares and also on school meals for the kids now there's politics of food labour smell blood yep. they want an election yep they the want to right, is it going the- to happen these these losses are going to continue. They're going to keep losing um, votes. There's no doubt about that. It's abundantly clear because of the parliamentary numbers. But one of the big issues here is that their competency is in question. And a competent government would not have lost these votes because they would have run a budget competently, like Alec did when he ran a minority government. And to give you an example is the Wind Fund Shona Robson has had to admit that she's dipping into the money from the wind auction, which should have been a wind fund like the oil fund that we should have had, like Norway's got. And when you look at the detail of the wind auctions, as we've said so many times before, those were reverse auctions where they fixed a maximum price as opposed to a minimum price. And there's a good item, a good paper out this week from the Commonweal who analyse this and say that if Scotland had behaved in the same fashion as they did at an auction in New York... The Scotland auction thus far would have brought in £16 billion. What a bonanza. What could you have done with that? See those two votes, those votes that they lost during the week. When they happened, they would have walked it. They wouldn't have needed to bother with the votes because they wouldn't have been speaking about school meals for primary children. They would have been saying, hold the bus. It's free school meals at nursery, primary, secondary. Let's talk about colleges. Let's talk about people at universities. The world would have been our oyster. Rail fares, issues with the trains, forget about it. We need to buy new rolling stock. We need to modernise the train system. Easy done. Subsidising fares, of course we can do that because that money would have repeated and you know, it would have fed upon itself. 
that's what competent government does. You know, it's you don't you how you how you feed a man. You don't give him a fish. You give him a fishing rod and you teach him how to fish. That's what the Scottish government should be doing. Thinking big, thinking ahead, thinking about how you produce and you multiply and you make an economy work and you make it run. It's Alec like Neil and housing again. You don't just build houses, you employ people, whether it's the guy that digs the holes or the man in the JCB or the one that's that's the joiner or the window mate or whoever it is, or the, the wife in the corner shop that sells the workmen their pies and beans and that sort of thing. This is the kind of thinking that we need. And it's what we've not got. So I'm not sorry that they lost these votes. They're symbolic anyway. But they need to waken up to the fact that the SNP were supposed to be the vanguard of the independence movement. They were the cream of the crop. They were the freedom fighters who were out there destined to lead us into what should be our promised land. And instead of that, the movement's hearts have been in our boots because we've been betrayed over and over again particularly in the last few years. We can turn all of that around by reinstating competent government and giving people hope that is tangible, where you don't just say to them, jam tomorrow, you produce jam today and you prove that you can create jam tomorrow. That's what Scotland needs. And it's needed it for a long time, but it needs to be delivered now before we lose so many more people that are living on the fringes of our society because the 4,000 pensioners that will die this winter, unfortunately, is the tip of an enormous iceberg in Scotland, particularly with drink, drugs, suicide, mental health, deprivation, health inequalities, all the stuff that we speak about day in and day out. And it needs sorted because it is unnecessary. Yeah. John Swinney, call the Constitutional Convention next week. And get everybody in. And until we see you folks, you and yours, please take care. Through a Scottish Prism, the programme that is unapologetically pro-Scottish independence and anti-Westminster rule. Everything we say here is viewed through a Scottish Prism. Brought to you by Barhead Boy.